Specifically, we will talk about black hole entropy from two different perspectives today, both of which are prominent candidates for quantum gravity. In the first perspective, uh, the first perspective is string theory. I was expert on the site as Leopoldo Pandasayas. He did his PhD at the Moscow State University. He has had visiting appointments at the, at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics at the University of California, and also an associate position at the Abdus Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste. Now he's a senior professor at the Department of Physics at the University of Michigan. And Leopoldo is interested in string theory with a focus on quantum gravity and the gauge gravity duality, and also on the microscopic origin of black hole thermodynamics. So the other perspective that we will talk um, here about today is loop quantum gravity and spin forms. Our expert on this side is Alejandro Perez. Alejandro did his PhD at the University of Pittsburgh he has held postdoc and junior positions at Penn State University, and he is now a senior professor at the Center for Theoretical Physics in Marseille. Alejandro's interests are black holes in the context of loop quantum gravity and QFT and curved background, and implications, in particular implications of Planckian discreteness for physics at low energies. So for what follows, we have asked the young researchers of quantum gravity community to submit questions in advance. And out of these questions, we have selected a rather broad set to which we expect both approaches to have answers to. And so if in the end time permits, we can also allow for questions from the audience, which can also be then more specific. So on this basis, thank you Alejandro and Leopoldo for agreeing to participate. And I think we are all looking forward to an instructive dialogue. So to start, I would like to ask you to introduce a bit more about yourself, in particular, what you're currently working on. So um, Leopoldo, if you want to go ahead, please do. All right. So thank you for the invitation. It's very, very exciting. Always a, a pleasure to talk to young, young people. Um, so thank you for the introduction, very thorough. So I'm, I am actually calling from, from the IAS, so where I was a long time ago, uh, kind of postdoc. I'm now um, IBM Einstein Fellow here, and I work on quantum aspects of uh, black holes. So my main interest uh, right now, most of what I'm working on is, um, is about uh, microscopic computation of the entropy of black holes. Uh, but very concretely in the context of the ADS-CFT correspondence, I hope that you, you have heard about it. It's uh, some sort of equivalence between theories with gravity and they admit a description in terms of vanilla quantum field theory. So we can do very precise computations in this setup. And so that's my main interest. Um, I can go into some details later on. So I think um, that there's some important lessons uh, there uh, to, to be gained. And um, so, yeah, so I, I, I am interested in, in doing the computation very precisely, not just the, the main, as you know, right, the entropy is, a, is an observable. So like many things in quantum field theory, it comes with an organization, a perturbative organization, if you wish. So there's the area divided by 4G part that, that we all know from Bekenstein and, and Hawking. But then there are quantum corrections to that. And uh, my main interest is in those uh, small corrections in particular, they're logarithmic in area corrections. So my last five years or so have been tackling that question in different setups. And, uh, and yeah, I can tell you in more detail later if you're interested about some concrete computations that we have managed to do in that setup where we can do the computation on the gravity side. This, the coefficient of the log is a very robust quantity. It cannot be affected by UV physics because the cutoff cannot affect the coefficient. And uh, we can compute it on the gravity side using essentially perturbative uh, gravity, and we can compute it on the field theory side. And we can, uh, if we have agreement, then that's a, a big um, fact that helps you understand that, yes, probably we are on the right track. We are counting the, the, the degrees of freedom correctly. So, so that's roughly what, what, I'm, what I'm working on. I, I want to emphasize that this is not just uh, doing more of the same in the sense that uh, in quantum field theory, sometimes you compute and you keep computing. Um, so it, it turns out that, of course, in, in a question in, you know, in a setup like gravity, where many things are determined by symmetries, uh, you can have the right answer 
uh, for the wrong reason. So my favorite example about this is the, the, the Bohr atom, right? So you can think that the electron is a planet that moves around some other big planet. And, uh, and with that kind of analysis, you can get the Bohr levels more or less correctly. Of course, you need quantization of angular momentum, but there's no Schrodinger equation. There's nothing uh, deep about this statement. And still it will give you the right Bohr atoms. But if you want to look at things like a fine structure constant, then this sort of naive symmetry-based picture is not going to work out. So that's why I'm interested in understanding the entropy beyond the, 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 the big chunk area divided by 4G and going into, into, you know, into a small correction that most really test the quantum nature of, of the duality. So I, okay. I think I, I will stop because I can go on for a long time. So I'll, I'll let no. Alejandro. Thank you very much for the first glimpse and to your interests. Um, so Alejandro, please go ahead. I think uh, you're muted. Thank you very much for, for the invitation and I'm very happy to be here uh, and having the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the, the things I do and the things I have worked in. Uh, worked on. Uh, so I, I, I am currently working mainly on things that are related to the question of this uh, panel, uh, but it's more about uh, uh, the information puzzle, uh, Hawking's information puzzle, uh, or the fate of unitarity in black hole evaporation. Uh, it's very much related in our, from our perspective to the question of black hole entropy. I have worked for quite some time on calculating black hole entropy in loop quantum gravity. Um, I think we're going to go into more details as uh, as we continue this this panel. Uh, but one thing that I can say in this opening statement is that uh, it's it's very good that you have chosen uh, these two perspectives because I think they are very much uh, contrasting. According to uh, our perspective. Uh, uh, Black hole entropy is uh, related to uh, the number of states a black hole communicate with the exterior. Uh, however, uh, there are other approaches in which uh, black hole entropy is directly thought of as a measure of the number of internal states of the black hole. And so this is uh, uh, this uh, we, we, this is a key question I think that should be settled in discussions about quantum gravity in an approach like ours. Uh, Holography is not motivated in any way by uh, so what some people sometimes call the holographic principle. Uh, uh, you know, related uh, statements are usually motivated, uh, you know, to a great deal. I mean, uh, or were motivated by the idea that entropy of a black hole scales like uh, an area, uh, suggesting some some form of uh, holographic uh, principle. From the perspective that I uh, explore, uh, the fact that the entropy scales with the area is very natural, and it's also something that can be justified from the perspective of quantum field theory and curved space times. Uh, and the measure, the entropy of black hole, again, is a measure of the number of states that the black hole is able to communicate, I mean, interact with uh, the exterior, not a measure of the uh, number of internal states of a black hole. This statement is very important both for you know, the way in which we approach the problem of black hole entropy and for the problem of unitarity uh, and the fate of, uh, you know, the fate of information or, uh, in black hole evaporation. So I am lately, uh, my theoretical uh, work uh, is mostly related to, 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 to the question of unitarity in the context of black holes, but I have been also, and two, the two things are actually motivated by the, by the same thing, uh, been exploring, as it was mentioned at the beginning, uh, the possible phenomenological implications of the existence of this discreteness that uh, in approaches to quantum gravity like ours is predicted, you know, at the Planck scale. Uh, if the space-time geometry is actually emerging from something that is fundamentally discrete at the Planck scale, then there should be, we might expect some phenomenological implications at low energies, and these are, this is the subject of some of my late explorations and maybe I should kind of stop there and we can go on with the discussion. 
Yes, thank you. I believe later on we will in particular discuss what are these microscopic degrees of freedom and microstates that contribute to the counting. But first of all, I think you already mentioned a few times, we all know this formula that the Bekenstein Hawking entropy equals the horizon area divided by one fourth. And so can you explain what is so fascinating about this formula or why should we expect this to be of any relevance for quantum gravity if you know that it already arises at a semi-classical level? Alejandro, do you want to start? Yeah, uh, I thought that it would be nice to show you some pictures. Uh, of, so can I share my screen? Yes, you should be able to. Uh, all right, so the, the, you see my screen now. And so I have two, I have two PDFs here. That I wanted to see. Is this one? Uh, so, well, the, the thing is, this uh, you know, this is just a picture of generic black hole, an eternal black hole. So, this is a classical picture. There is no black hole evaporation. I am just only bringing this up because I wanted to talk about the the first law. So, we know from you know classical general relativity. Uh, we expect at the classical level, no quantum effects around that the, the space time. So if we take h bar to zero, so to say, or in the limit in which we neglect uh, Hawking evaporation, black holes formed from, gen, you know, from uh, the collapse of, of matter. If we wait long enough, they become stationary. This is uh, what uh, uh, they, they should become stationary on physical grounds once all the you know, the very dynamical phase of the gravitational collapse has passed, gravitational waves go out to infinity, matter radiation goes out to infinity, and the system settles down to a stationary situation. That is uh, the no hair theorem that tells us that, uh, you know, if the black hole form at some point from gravitational collapse, this is a Penrose diagram of uh, gravitational collapse, so this is a compactification of uh, space time containing a black hole that is assumed to be asymptotically flat here. So long time after the collapse, if nothing else falls into the black hole, the black hole becomes stationary. And the no hair theorem says that it is uh, labeled by only handful of parameters, their mass, angular momentum, and charge. We can now perturb this black hole. So we take it out of equilibrium by throwing some additional matter that this is what you see here in this picture. And so uh, again, we expect stationarity to be attained later on. And when we reach another equilibrium state, uh, the no hair theorem tell us that we should expect the new black hole to be again one member of the Kern Newman family with the same parameters, uh, with the same number of parameters, but with readjust parameters. The mass will change, the angular momentum will change, the charge will change. And Einstein's equations imply you can use linearized uh, Einstein's equations if this is a, a very small perturbation that black hole satisfy this enigmatic uh, law that it's uh, completely analogous to a thermodynamical law. One has the change in the mass. It's given by the work done by the perturbation, the angular momentum change given by the perturbation times the angular velocity of the black hole and, uh, and this uh, electromagnetic work term that is the potential electrostatic potential at the horizon times the change in the charge. So you would expect this to be related to the change in the energy of the system, which is the mass. But there is this third participant here, which is the analog of the heat term. So that is the surface gravity over two pi times the change in the area over four. Now, all this is just an analogy at the classical level, but we also know that black holes satisfy the second law, namely that the, this area here is the analog of an entropy. And then when we turn on quantum mechanics, we know that this is actually the Hawking temperature. So this third term here must be interpreted as a heat term. So why is it that black hole entropy is so fascinating? Because it's telling us, like in thermodynamics, you know, you, we discover similar first laws if we do thermodynamics. And the, the presence of, an, of a heat term in conservation of energy, maybe right, I mean, this, if you deal with, uh, you know, uh, systems uh, 
like uh, re uh, rigid body systems, then you do work on the system. The change in the energy is equal to the work you do on the system. Now, th so thermodynamic systems are different because when you do work on, on them, you, do, you push a piston, for instance, uh, the amount of energy you gain is always, uh, I mean, there's this third element appearing in the conservation of energy law, which is the first law, which is this heat term. And the heat term reveals the existence of microscopic degrees of freedom in the case of thermodynamics, in the case of a regular gas. It tells us about you know, the microscopic nature of matter. Similarly, in the context of black hole, this first law combined with the second law and with the, you know, the fact that we know the black holes radiate and therefore this is actually a temperature, it tells us that this entropy must be something that we should be able to explain or it reveals the existence of this you know, microscopic degrees of freedom and uh, that, we, uh, that are to be understood, to be described. And so this is why black hole entropy is so important for theories of quantum gravity. Uh, theory of quantum gravity, understanding quantum gravity involves in particular understanding what are the microscopic rules and how out of, uh, of these microscopic views of films and how from them we actually obtain this contribution to the first law that arises in the context of classical or at low energies. Like in thermodynamics, you know, the laws of, uh, of, uh, of uh, quantum mechanics and the microscopic, you know, degrees of freedoms involving uh, molecules or, or atoms in the gas are, uh, you know, in the, in the, the statistic mecha statistical mechanics is the way we actually explain the existence of this third term in the, uh, in the first law. So this is why black hole entropy is a key question for quantum gravity. Thank you for this explanation. Um, Leopoldo, do, would you like to add something? Uh, no, I think, I mean, I can add a little bit, but uh, but the, 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 that's really the heart of the question. So we, we find this quantity uh, in some semi-classical approximation, actually classical approximation. There are different ways to, to understand the first law. This is one of them. When you perturb the black hole, there are other ways that you can try to think about it as dropping something through the horizon, et cetera. But, but this is very robust and, and not many assumptions go into this. And this is a very important result. And we want to understand this microscopically. When we have a gas and we know the gas has a pressure, we, we are not happy knowing that, okay, I, I know the pressure of the gas and I know density. I, I would like to also know a statistical mechanically where is the pressure coming from? Of course, we learned that this is, has to do with kinetic energy of molecules, et cetera. And that's really the question that we want to answer for black holes. Where is this, where is the, the underlying microscopic principle of this formula? I totally agree. Okay, thank you. So I think uh, we're now ready to go into slightly more details. Um, and for the next, let, let me remind you that the audience are young researchers from the um, broad area of quantum gravity. They're working on different approaches. So please be as pedagogical as possible for the following. And I would like to ask you, what are the key ingredients in the steps of in the steps uh, for the steps in the computation of black hole entropy and loop quantum gravity and string theory? In particular, which standard assumptions go in and which rather controversial assumptions are being made? Um, yeah, so Leopoldo, you can start. Yeah, I, I also would like to share. I have, um, oops. Oh, sorry, so I should stop sharing. I don't know if I can, yeah. if I can. Uh, so let's start here. Um, sorry. <clears throat> All right, so, so Alejandro mentioned the first law. There's, of course, second law. Uh, I'll go over this quickly. Um, well, this, this is uh, something that has made it to the news. Um, so my answer, my answer will not be completely satisfactory. So let me first, my caveat, um, because I'm going to answer the question of black hole entropy in a very special particular context. It's not for all black holes. It's not for astrophysical black holes. It's not for black holes in... Uh, in flat space. It's for black holes in asymptotic, asymptotically anti desider space. So this is a, you might want to say, this is a toy model inside a toy model, but, but here we have absolute control. And that's what I want to, to emphasize. Um, so, so this is, uh, I, I'm used, so about the ingredient, this is my main ingredient. I use the ADS-CFT correspondence. This is um, 
a correspondent that, that states that you can compute um, quantum field theory partition function, everything that you, that there's an equivalence, a precise equivalence, mathematical equivalence between theories that are quantum field theories, ordinary particle theories that we know and love, and theories of gravity in anti desider space. anti desider space is like a, well, it's a hyperbolic sphere, so it should be clear, okay? So this is, in this context, I will answer the question very precisely. So this is number ingredient number one. I assume uh, this framework. Okay, we can discuss about the framework, but let's assume the framework. Uh, this is the question. So first, I want to understand, of course, um, the micro the, the entropy. I want to give it a microscopic, as I said, my my analogy is always with molecules. I think this should be very clear uh, to everybody from from basically uh, undergraduate physics. Um, I, I mentioned already in my introduction that I, I am not happy with understanding the big chunk, the area divided by four. I also would like to understand this kind of correction, logarithmic corrections to the, the area. These are very special corrections, uh, but they, but they, as I said, they can be computed on both sides of the correspondent. This coefficient beta here, I can compute using gravity techniques and I can put, compute using field theory techniques. So that gives, if, if I get the same number and I do, uh, that gives me confidence that I am really using the right degrees of freedom to describe it. Um, all right, so once, so maybe I'll, I'll go here. So, so once I have accepted ADS-CFT correspondence, um, we know now from, you know, on the graduate stat MEC that what I need to do to compute uh, the degeneracy of the states is, uh, the best way to do that is through the partition function. So you end up computing partition functions of this type. Now, what is here? So e to the minus beta h is something that, again, we all know from, from undergraduate stat MEC, but these are partition functions. In general, these are hard to compute, but if you want to compute them in a way that, that uses the properties of the theories that, you're, that, that you have at your disposal, you have to decorate them. So one thing is, of course, chemical potential is, is also understood. I can, I can count states considering also their charge, but here I will count fermions and bosons differently. And I do this in a context of a supersymmetry theory. But once, uh, for this partition function, I can, well, um, there are techniques that completely give you the solution exactly, right? So you can compute this exactly. So what that means is that allows you to, um, I have uh, too much stuff here, but that allows you to, there's a, the big chunk will come, so n is like one over Newton constant. So the, the, the term that will give you the entropy is this one, the first term, but I can go and expand all the way down because this is a, an exact in n expression and I can compute also the logarithmic terms. So in this case, this is this coefficient. So I will not, not bore you with, with all the details, but this is a field theory computation. So it's very straightforward. Write the partition function, find the partition function in, in a parameter that is Newton's constant and read the, the, the area divided by 4G as the degeneracy the, the of a state of that partition function. And you can also read the logarithmic term. So that's uh, roughly the ingredients that go into the ADS computation of, of, of uh, black hole entropy. So you, you change your problem, a gravity problem. So you identify the system that describes that black hole, but the system turns out to be a, a, a vanilla, as I said, vanilla quantum field theory, where we know the techniques and we can apply them. And, and get the results. So that's 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 really, uh, so I can do this for many, many black holes. Well, okay, I, I will not bother you with a lot of technical details, but I, let me re-emphasize. I use ADS-CFT and then I, I use a standard quantum mechanics or statistical mechanics to do the counting of the generacy of states. And that counting, I can do so precisely that I reproduce not only the leading bekenstein hogan piece, area divided by 4G, for G, but I can also reproduce logarithmic corrections to the entropy. So if you have taken quantum field theory, um, this is a little bit like, uh, like computing uh, anomalies. So they are protected, they are completely one loop. Once you have them, uh, they are very robust. It's very, it's very easy, given a theory, to, to find the, the anomaly or the contribution to the anomaly. And this is kind of at that level of robustness. So it's a, it's a very good test. So those are the ingredients that go on, on this, Again, so maybe I make a, another comment just to, to help uh, the younger people. So in, 1990, in 1996, string theory answered already the question about the microstate counting of, of certain black holes. 
that's the, the, the well-known Strominger buff accounting of black hole entropy, right? So string theory did it in 1996 using the brains and what I would call uh, string technology, purely string technology. So which you might, you might like it, you might not, but that was done. So now in 2018, uh, there is a solution to the same problem for asymptotically ADS black holes using not some fancy deep brain technology, but just vanilla quantum field theory. Just this is my quantum field theory, and I just count following textbook the partition function from which I get the degeneracy, which agrees with the black hole entropy, including logarithmic corrections to that. That's the status. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think it's um, a particularly interesting question about these corrections. Um, logarithmic corrections are what you expect from the point of view of quantum field theory, but maybe there are also other examples of universality classes. And yeah, so Alejandro, would you like to describe to us how is um, black hole entropy derived in LQG and maybe also comment more towards what type of corrections do you expect from loop quantum gravity? Okay, yes, let me share my screen again. Okay, so, uh, um, all right, so this is a, a slide from a course I gave recently, and it's probably good to uh, motivate uh, the loop quantum gravity calculation. So, uh, as I said, black hole entropy from our perspective is not the number of states, uh, the internal states of the black hole. That's an essential key uh, point. Uh, uh, I believe in string theory, that's not what you, one does. It would be nice to, to, to get confirmation from you, Leopold, what kind of thing one is com computing. Is it, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, it's, I think it's important for clarifying the, 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 the different perspectives. Uh, the, from our perspective, uh, the uh, black hole entropy arises from, um, uh, this point of view, where we see, uh, you know, uh, we start from quantum field theory and we try to define uh, the entropy of whatever remains outside or is outside of the black hole. Now we are, I have replaced the picture we saw before by a black hole that forms via gravitational collapse and then evaporates via Hawking radiation. This is a uh, uh, Penrose diagram that people often uh, draw. Uh, there are some some features of this diagram that, for you know, other reasons, might be expected to be modified. But uh, that, that's kind of the standard picture one often sees. You know, we have a black hole that forms, it slowly evaporates until it completely evaporates, and so at future null infinity, we see again. I am assuming asymptotic flatness here. We see Hawking radiation, that, you know, which is approximately thermal for a long time until the black hole shrinks to uh, complete evaporation. Now, uh, if one takes a Cauchy surface, which is a space-like surface where one could in principle give initial data to reproduce, uh, at least in this picture, the past. So in order to reproduce the future, there are some questions and the issue of information arises from a picture like this but I'm not gonna conceal the future yet. I mean, when we talk about information, maybe. Uh, so a Cauchy surface is just a good initial uh, value surface. Then uh, one can characterize the entropy of the radiation that has been emitted the, uh, after the black hole has completely evaporated by calculating the entanglement entropy between you know, the uh, quantum field, I mean, the degrees of freedom of fields outside with respect to degrees of freedom inside. And uh, so it's possible to argue in the context of quantum field theory that that entanglement entropy will give you actually the entropy of the Hawking radiation of the evaporation process. Similarly, if you calculate this entanglement entropy earlier on, say on a, on a Cauchy surface like this one where the black hole is still macroscopic, here the black hole has basically shrunk to nothing, to a very small uh, size. But in some intermediate instant, the black hole would have some finite area, okay? And so the entanglement entropy, if you calculate it in terms of uh, uh, quantum field theory, then you find that uh, it would contain a finite term. So this is the entanglement entropy when you trace out the degrees of field inside. 
you get a finite contribution, which corresponds to the uh, Hawking radiation that has been already emitted. The black hole has been there for a while. It has shrunk a little bit, but it's still a microscopic black hole. And you get a divergent contribution whose you know, main term diverges in a way that is proportional to the area. And there, is, there are these logarithmic corrections to the entanglement entropy. Now, the point is that in quantum field theory, this first term is completely ambiguous. These logarithmic corrections are actually not ambiguous, and this is why it is a very nice mathematical physics problem to try to compute this, uh, this cor uh, these corrections. Uh, but uh, so the question is, what is this leading contribution? And in quantum field theory, uh, there is no uh, well-defined answer because of ultraviolet divergences. Um, so what we expect is that in a theory that is finite at, at the Planck scale, in a theory where there are no ultraviolet divergences, this would be divergent contribution actually produces uh, black hole entropy, is what we interpret as black hole entropy. This is why, and okay. Now it is possible to, to argue, I'm trying to change slides, but it's not happening. I know I did, okay. Uh, now, uh, if you look at the microscopic neighborhood of the horizon, then you see that stationary observers close to the horizon actually see, uh, you know, a thermal bath of a temperature which is much higher than the Hawking temperature. This is the Unruh temperature for these local stationary observers. And this temperature just blows up as you approach the horizon. So when you're talking about the UV diversion piece, you're talking about degrees of freedom, which in this, uh, in the state that describes uh, a black hole that has formed via gravitational collapse, are in a in a very high uh, temperature um, regime, in which you know very very temperatures that blow that go all uh, that go off to to infinity at very high temperatures. All possible states are equally likely. And so you can, it's possible to argue, I mean, from this you argue physically that this would be divergent term is, is uh, actually should be a measure of the number of degrees of freedom or a measure of the dimension of the Hilbert space corresponding to surface states, to the immediate neighborhood of the horizon. And so this is the thing that we actually uh, calculate in loop quantum gravity. So we, uh, uh, we uh, try to count, we count, we define the number of microstates of the horizon, we, and, and we count how many of those are compatible with a given microscopic area. So the key ingredient in that is discreteness. So the area of a black hole, uh, I mean, there is, there is a, a, an area operator associated to the horizon of a black hole, and there are many, many different microscopic states corresponding to this very same macroscopic area. And we basically do a, a accounting of the number of, of states that correspond to this, to this, um, to this um, macroscopic area. And we find a result that is proportional to the area. Now we don't, um, yeah. Maybe before you move on, there's a question. So can you clarify, is talking entropy entanglement entropy or thermodynamical entropy? Entanglement entropy is also, it's the same thing as a, a thermodynamical ent entropy in certain uh, yeah. situations. So yeah, maybe, so maybe. If you, if you do, if you, if, if you do have, uh, for instance, uh, uh, I mean, this entanglement entropy contains uh, the thermodynamical entropy of the radiation outside and the area contribution is actually black hole entropy. So yeah, I wanted to, to say something that is yeah. a little bit more, more mathematical. So I, I think we will agree that, that uh, black hole entropy should be entanglement entropy, but we also know that the thermodynamic entropy bounds the, the entanglement entropy. So that, that, in fact, if you look at this, um, your density matrix, when your density matrix is diagonal, you have the maximum, and that's what you assume uh, for the okay, thermodynamic. But, but, but then you say, we are, okay, so, uh, but uh, the Stromich and Waffa calculation is not the calculation of entanglement entropy. Is, is that uh, correct? I... No, no, neither is mine. So, so, but, uh, but, but the, again, but the thermodynamic entropy bounds the, the, 
the entanglement entropy. And, and that in that sense, um, in that sense, we are trying to compute the same thing. But I, I wanted yeah. to emphasize that more, more, more precisely, it's really entanglement entropy one one should be after. Uh, it's just that that is a little bit uh, harder to compute in some in some situations. So one one can go easier with the with the thermodynamic entropy and, and be guaranteed that you have a bound at least. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so uh, may, maybe to 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 close uh, because uh, I mean I I took some time to explain the motivation and what is it that we compute. So we actually count the number of states corresponding to this uh, uh, horizon in the uh, in the microscopic theory that predicts discreteness. And so there is an uh, area operator with, uh, with uh, eigenvalues which are discrete. So you simply reduce the calculation to the counting of number of states. Now, uh, well, the assumption is that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, one of the assumptions is one, one strong assumption at the moment is that in fact, uh, it would be nice to actually have uh, a theory sufficiently under control so that from that, UV, you know, this microscopic theory, we actually uh, reach uh, the quantum field theory regime and actually show how what we are computing is actually the would be divergent term of entanglement entropy. This is some, okay, so this is not something we are able to do at the moment. So uh, it's something that would be very interesting to be able to do, but it's not, it's out of reach at the present stage of, uh, of understanding, okay? So the, this is an assumption. The assumption is that uh, the counting we are making is actually uh, what actually would lead to this uh, regularized would-be diversion term that in, in, in a theory where everything is under control, we can start from the microscopic theory and actually con con compute this entanglement entropy, find the finite term that corresponds to the, the thing that you would obtain in quantum field theory, and the would-be diversion term would be the, the Hawking, Be Bekenstein Hawking term, plus presumably with logarithmic corrections, which are compatible with uh, quantum field theories. Uh, I mean, maybe I should stop there. I think there are other questions where some of the things I want to say will just come up naturally. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, I think as a next uh, step, it would be good to clarify really the notion of what is it that you count? So what are the microstates and do, do we speak the same languages when we talk about counters, counting of states in a given thermodynamical or statistical ensemble? Um, Leopoldo, would you like to start? So what, what is it that you count? Okay, so that's a very, very nice question. So I want to, to clarify. So as a, as, a, as a theorist, right? So, so we make our own judgment of, of what, you know, what I want to work on, what I do not want to work on. So I, I like gravity. Gravity, I think, is the most exciting uh, thing to do. And, um, but I would prefer, I, but my personal taste is to be on the, I would say, a slightly more conventional uh, sort of type. So, okay. So when we talk about ADS-CFT, I have to be, I'll make a disclaimer, but make a clarification. So there have been in the last three, four years, a lot of development in understanding the entanglement entropy of black holes and the page curve and how to compute them. But this is to my taste, okay, this is now a personal perspective. This is all very correct, but it's been done for, you know, for in a very, very, you know, in a, in a, in a toy situation of two dimensional black holes, which I, don't, I mean, it's not that I don't like, but this is not my taste. This is not what I want to do. So that has been developed. This is what, you know, what a lot of people in a string theory are doing. So the story that I'm, that I'm discussing, what I work on is a slightly a step behind that. It's not as, I would say, conceptually up to date, but it's very robust and it's very concrete. That's that I, I enjoy that. And that's what, I, what I'm doing. So, but I want to emphasize that, yes, uh, from the point of view of a string theory, it is on there's the, the so-called um, central dogma that that the, you know in ads CFT that black holes are quantum states and and you have to essentially compute you know entangling of, of that quantum state with with radiation or, or or the outside of the black hole etc. Now those computations are hard to do for realistic you know in four dimensions five dimensions etc. And and what you can do is the computation that I that I describe with which is just Here's your field theory. Here's your, you know, your your fields, all your ingredients. 
count them very carefully and, and, and look at the genesis. How many states do you have for a given charge and a given mass and a given angular momentum? That I can compute, and I have computed for ADS black holes in four, five, six, and seven dimensions, and I have computed also for regions, and they all match. So that's sort of where I, I want to make that distinction between what is very solid and what is a little bit more speculative, but conceptually, uh, I would say, more advanced. So I hope that that, that becomes clear. So yes, my yes. computation is, I take a field theory, like n equal four super young mills, or there's a, some three-dimensional theories that look like the Chern-Simon theory that you might know from, from condensed matter about quantum hole effect or something. So these are very, very you know, down-to-earth theories. And I do my computation there. And I know that there's a black hole that is dual to that. For that black hole, you can use Einstein gravity and anti deceder and compute the area, compute corrections. And my computation in the field theory, that is, again, vanilla field theory, totally agree. So that's, that's, that's the, the playground where I, uh, where I work. And that's essentially what I have been discussing. Now, that being said, there is some discussion and, and, and some results, not completely, I, I would not say they are not to my satisfaction, but they are important conceptual uh, developments that, that are able to even explain the, the, the page curve. I don't know if you know about the, the page curve, uh, but it's essentially if you track the entanglement, uh, the entanglement entropy with time, it has to, if it's a unitary process, it can go up, but it has to come down. So all, all that discussion has been uh, developed for some toy models in, in a spin theory, but, but not for realist, well, realistic anti the black hole. Um, sorry, okay. just a quick question, basic question. Uh, what do you mean by the fact that the um, uh, entanglement entropy is the black hole entropy? So if you assume that, that the black hole is, is just a quantum state, uh, and I think that's what Alejandro was alluding to. Um, the, the things that you can, that you know, you have a quantum state that if you want to measure something, you have to do it through entanglement. It's, and that's essentially your only access. So you don't have any, any way to know a priori what are all the degrees of freedom inside that system. You can only talk about degrees of freedom with which you interact by entanglement, let's say. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so Alejandro, would you like to explain what are the microstates and loop quantum gravity? And maybe also, do you see any possible match between the string theory and loop quantum gravity perspective? Because in the end, we end up having the same result from both approaches. But yeah, maybe please uh, first start with the IQG perspective. Uh, okay, so what, what we count uh, is um, uh, microstates of the horizon only so we uh, that way is a micro canonical uh, ensemble type of calculation uh, the setup is extremely precise mathematically once you have given uh, once you have uh, you know uh, made that step of decide uh, you know, motivated by my previous discussion which which is uh, more uh, formal because it uses the connection between the microscopic theory and quantum field theory, uh, the connection through entanglement entropy. And so what we are after is computing this would be diversion term in entanglement entropy, which is the one that is proportional to the area, which is the one that comes from degrees of freedoms very, very close to the horizon. And those are the ones that are responsible for uh, black hole entropy. So this would be diversion uh, contribution is, one can argue, given by the number of you know, the entropy is the log of the number of states of this horizon. And so what we do is because we understand the geometry, the microscopic geometry in the context of, you know, the loop quantum gravity uh, of, the, of the horizon, we can just uh, uh, count these microstates. So we basically count how many microscopic excitations. These are different quantum states corresponding to a horizon which looks the same for low energy observers. There's a coarse graining in the picture, like when you compute uh, uh, micro, micro canonical entropy of a, in a of a box for, uh, with, with the gas. Uh, you are counting how many states you have, microscopic states, which are compatible with a coarse grain notion of energy. So, uh, uh, so 
an energy defined by you know big uh, cores of servers, volume and number of particles. Here we do something similar. We count these micro microscopic states compatible with the given macroscopic area of the black hole, and we find that the logarithm of the of the number of states uh, is proportional to the area. So, uh, what what is the nature of these microscopic states? Well, I have to go back a little bit. Uh, I think I do have some pictures here. Maybe not in this. Uh, okay, yes, here it is. So, in loop quantum gravity, one starts from uh, classical the classical theory. One does the canonical quantization of the theory in a background independent way, and one finds that uh, uh, you know. Geometric observable, observables, things that are related to, you know, things that, are, that you can write in terms of the metric, like areas and volumes, become quantum operators which have uh, discrete spectra. So they are basic states in the theory which form a basis of quantum states for quantum gravity, uh, which are given by these uh, uh, excitations, which are uh, represented by graphs. These graphs live in a three-dimensional manifold. The graphs carry quantum numbers. The quantum numbers represent flux, fluxes. So these uh, links are labeled by representations of SU2, and uh, uh, which are quantum numbers uh, that represent basically fluxes of quantized area. So if you have a surface that is punctured by one of these links, like this, uh, this. Uh, uh, this one here, then and you, and you have uh, a spin J going through that, then that surface inherits or has an area. So this is an eigen state of the area of the surface with an eigenvalue given by the Planck's length square times this uh, discrete number that is related to this uh, J here. Similarly, intersections of these uh, uh, graphs are labeled by quantum numbers of volume. And so from all from this, it emerges a picture where geometry at the Planck scale is discrete and relational or you know, combinatorial. So you reconstruct geometry in the background independent way from these graphs and the labels they carry. So if you have you know, neighboring uh, nodes like this, then you can tell that this represents like you know, molecules of volume, pieces of volume connected together by uh, some quantum uh, excitation of area that tell us that tells you what is the area that these two pieces of volume actually share, and so from this, from these spin networks, you can reconstruct a, a discrete uh, notion of fundamental geometry. These are the fundamental states, and so when it comes to black holes, uh, again the framework is very precise because you have to uh, give a mathematical uh, definition of what a black hole is and so you have to put boundary conditions in uh, your uh, classical theory and do the canonical quantization with those boundary conditions and so you get some uh, very uh, very nice structure at the, at the boundary that defines the black hole horizon but the bottom line is that uh, you get uh, these bulk states which are the spin network states i was talking about that define the geometry outside of the black hole ending on punctures on the black hole horizon and each of these punctures carry quantum numbers of area and so the area of the black hole at the microscopic level is made of the contributions of this infinite of this uh, uh, of these uh, uh, many punctures so you have an area operator uh, and so then then it it becomes just a statistic, standard statistical mechanical calculation where you count how many of those states are compatible with a microscopic area and from there, you find the value of an entropy, which is given by this expression. You actually, uh, there is a numerical value uh, in front of the Bekenstein Hawking result. And there is a parameter I didn't talk about because, I mean, in this, uh, uh, in loop quantum gravity, there is a parameter that enters into the definition of the phase space of, of gravity. And this parameter appears in the, uh, form of the spectrum of the area operator and so it appears in the result of the calculation so when you count uh, these geometric excitations only then the black hole entropy counting gives you a result that is of this form where this gamma naught is just a numerical number a numerical factor that comes out of the counting 
And so for a while, the perspective has been, the perspective held by a certain number of people uh, that one has to, in order to have agreement with the Beckishman and Hawking uh, result, one has to tune this uh, parameter, which is called the immunity parameter to that particular value. This is not necessarily my viewpoint. And, and so this is, a, this, is a, this is an area where we go into, you know, this is an area under development where all, not uh, everybody agrees on. But uh, from my perspective, the, uh, the, the aspect that is missing in this calculation is that one is not properly taking into account the possible matter contributions to this counting. So not only one should count uh, the geometry uh, degeneracy of states associated to a microscopic area, but also the mi microscopic uh, um, contributions from uh, matter. And this is something that is not so easy to actually do in a precise way at, uh, at this level of development of the approach. But there are some calculations that suggest that if you do actually take this into account appropriately, then uh, the immunity parameter dependence would drop out and you would get the Beckenstein Hawking uh, area, uh, the uh, Beckenstein Hawking formula. So, my perspective is that this calculation should evolve and include matter contributions. And when we learn how to do that, then we would obtain the, the expected result without having to fix the emission parameter. Uh, all right. So, but. Uh, 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 I just want to make a remark about, because there is something that we are not, uh, uh, um, Leopold talked about the page curve uh, and, uh, uh, and this, this takes us to the question of information. It depends on your perspective, what, what uh, happens with this page curve. If uh, from our perspective, the page curve does not need to go down until very, very late. And very, very late means once you can no longer actually talk about uh, the presence of a black hole. However, if you think that the black hole entropy is a measure of the number of internal states of the black hole, then you're forced to show that the, that the page curve, so that the one that uh, 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 tells you about uh, you know, the entropy content of the uh, outside has to go down while the black hole is, uh, macroscopic by uh, about a time that is called the page time. But the black hole is still macroscopic. And so you can still, uh, uh, you know, you don't have very big quantum effects near the horizon because curvature near the horizon can be as low as you want by taking a sufficiently large black hole that has been evaporated for a long time. But suddenly something very special has to start happening. When you think that black hole entropy measures the number of states inside of the horizon. From our perspective, because black hole entropy is not the number of states inside, but it's the number of states of the boundary only, so it's the number of states that communicate with the outside, then for in order to have compatibility with unitarity, the page curve, you know, the state can be purified, but much, much later when the black hole is not necessarily there anymore. So uh, uh, I just wanted to say that when is it that the page curve goes down is a matter of uh, uh, you know active uh, strong uh, uh, discussion I, I would say this is not completely obvious and settled in the community I would say. Okay, yeah, thank you, Alejandro. You've already um, answered part of my other questions, uh, which were related to this factor of one fourth and whether you need additional adjustments to recover this factor. There is one question in the chat related to what you just explained, and it is about these punctures. Um, so these punctures are something like localized events in space time, whereas the horizon is a global notion. So how do you deal with this um, with respect to the equivalence principle? Uh, can you repeat the question again? So these punctures yes. are localized events, but the horizon is a global notion. So how can you reconcile both notions? Um, if you so, so you you are actually describing an equilibrium situation. So these punctures are there on the horizon for all times. Okay, so they are not localized in uh, in uh, in time. Okay, it's not. Uh, so I am showing a picture of. Uh, this is just a picture, but actually you uh, uh, you actually 
get to this uh, model in which you know how to actually define the quantum states and count them by assuming that you have boundary conditions uh, on a null surface that actually represent uh, a black hole that is uh, in equilibrium. So a black hole that is time translational invariant. And, and this is only an idealization or an approximation that is expected to be good for black holes that are sufficiently big Microscopic, so that you can neglect the Hawking radiation. And the fact that actually real black holes uh, cannot be uh, exactly in thermal equilibrium because they are evaporating. Okay, I see Michael is nodding. Okay, um, I guess this answers the question. So um, we talk now more in the perspective of this factor, which seems to be more of an issue for the AQG. A computation. On the other hand, Alejandro you also mentioned briefly the uh, principle of background independence. We know LQG insists on being um, background independent versus string theory is commonly said to be background dependent. Leopoldo, is this an issue for the computation of black hole entropy and string theory? Um, right. So, I mean, Yes, it is true that most of the formulations of, of string theory that, that, we, that we have on the control are background dependent. Um, now, I want to emphasize that uh, in the context of uh, asymptotically ADS gravity, that's a different, uh, that's a different story in, in the sense there's some, it's a little bit, so I, I don't know if you have experience with ADS, but ADS is a space where uh, things can go to the boundary and bounce back in, in finite time. So it is it is a way to define gravity in which, um, so it's not a hyperbolically complete if you wish. So, so you need to specify uh, extra data at the boundary. That is a blessing, uh, you know, in, in some sense. So, so in this context, I think, um, one can, one is able to define gravity in in uh, in, in 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 this context. Is it, it can be defined uh, in a nicer way? I'll say. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I have nothing deep to add about that uh, charge, if you wish. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. So we are already over an hour. I would say um, we can go for two more questions. The, um, the next one is, can you remind us of the black hole information paradox in particular? What does loop quantum gravity or string theory have to say about this? How do you resolve there? Is there, is there a problem at all? Um, so Alejandro, I know you've been working a lot in this direction. Um, would you like to start? Okay, yes. Uh, let me share the screen again and then you see if I choose the right, uh, I think it's this one. It's, uh, Um, okay, so uh, just again, I mean, and for the students in assuming that this is helpful, okay, so why is it that we think that uh, the number of states of inside of a black hole cannot be bounded? Uh, well, this is by, by the, cannot be bounded by the area of, of the black hole. Uh, one can, uh, I mean, uh, if one uses quantum field theory then, uh, and precisely uh, one uh, thinks about unitarity, then what one has is that, so, so this is a space time that is not evaporating. And so maybe it's not, uh, hmm, okay, maybe here. What I want to say is that, okay, so this is an evaporating black hole and uh, it, the, the picture is very different from this one. And this is essential. So may, maybe I should start from here. This is the typical, this is the picture that Hawking drew trying to explain the problem of uh, unitarity. So the problem is as follows. If you believe that the black hole forms and then slowly evaporates until it completely disappears and the picture of uh, space time looks more or less like, the, like this one, then, uh, then uh, there seems to be an obvious uh, issue, okay? Uh, and the issue is, as, is the following. So 
from the point of view of quantum field theory on curved space time, there is no problem between, uh, in, you know, for unitary evolution from, say, an instant of time sigma one, so a Cauchy surface sigma one to a Cauchy surface sigma two. In fact, the basic construction of quantum fields on curved space times uses, for instance, the Klein Gordon product. If we're talking about some, some, some very simplistic, very simple model of uh, degree of freedom that we quantize. And the uh, Klein Gordon product is uh, independent of the Cauchy surface you choose. And this is at the heart of the unitarity of the quantization that you produce. Uh, and so in quantum field theory and curved space times, there is absolutely no problem to define a unitary evolution from sigma one to sigma two and or from sigma one to any Cauchy surface that is to the past of the interior singularity. And uh, now uh, we, this is uh, also another way of understanding this more intuitively is that as the black hole shrinks and produces particles that go out to infinity as Hawking radiation, there are Hawking pairs which are correlated with the outside radiation that fall into the singularity. And so as long as you keep track of both the particles excitations inside and, th and those that would become Hawking radiation outside, the evolution is perfectly unitary. Now, the problem is that all, all these excitations that you have created inside, which are correlated with the outside so that the total state will be a pure state. By the way, in this most simplistic idealization, you assume that you start with a pure state in the past. So you have some vacuum state plus the, some state of matter fields. So this is a pure state. And uh, because you have a unitary evolution, this state remains pure. So the, the state remains pure because, uh, because, because you have unitary evolution and unitary evolution uh, tracks you know, correlations between what would become uh, Hawking radiation and things that fall inside, particles excitations inside. And as long as you keep track of both, unitarity is perfectly, uh, it holds perfectly. And there is no conflict whatsoever. The problem is that all these interior excitations are falling into the singularity, they are falling into a place where quantum field theory does not work. That's a, it's not a, a, a correct description of what's going on. But already here, we see a key aspect. I think it is a key uh, for me and for many people in my, in my field. I mean, that again, sets, uh, you know, defines, uh, uh, separates uh, clearly different perspectives. And the key aspect is that if you want to actually describe what is the fate of unitarity, namely, what, what, what is, you really have to deal with the physics near the singularity. Okay, so the problem of unitarity is that if you ignore what happened with this, these, these excitations that fell into the singularity and you look at something uh, at physics at an instant sigma three here much later, you seem to have only Hawking radiation, which is approximately thermal and nothing else to correlate it with. So that this final state here at sigma three is, it seems, uh, a mixed state. It's a state which is uh, a thermal state. Thermal state is not a pure state. A thermal state is a mixed state. It has a non-trivial entropy, you, start, you know, von Neumann entropy. I mean, you take the state, you make a, a density matrix and you calculate, you know, the trace minus the trace of rho log rho, you find something different. You would seem to find something different from zero here, while initially it was zero. But a unitary evolution cannot change the uh, von Neumann entropy. So the question is, how is it that this final state is actually? So what is it? Where are the correlations between these particles here? Uh, where did they go? Okay. So this, I mean, this state looks uh, uh, mixed. If I look at it in sigma three, but if I look at it in sigma two, where I do have the internal degrees of freedom falling into the singularity, then the state is perfectly pure. The von Neumann entropy is zero and consist consistently zero to the past in all these instances. So the key point here for us is that you cannot answer the question of what happened to the information at late stages here if you don't take care of what is what happens with these excitations that actually fell into the singularity? So, with that idea in mind, also only, and if you believe that this is correct, what I'm saying, you can just go to the literature and divide the literature into those that 
try to solve the information puzzle and namely explain how is it that the evolution is actually unitary from the initial instant to after the black hole has evaporated without ever invoking any physics near the singularity or people that try to involve the physics near the singularity. I believe that you cannot answer the question without invoking physics near the singularity because of what I am uh, explaining here, basically, because the correlations uh, that were essential for maintaining unitarity before are correlations with degrees of freedoms that are forced to hit the ultraviolet regime where quantum gravity should actually play a role. And so in a theory like loop quantum gravity, even though this is not something that we can actually uh, show precisely in full generality, but in some models for black holes, one can actually construct toy models where this happens. And, and there are ways of arguing that this is uh, something we should expect. We don't expect the singularity actually to, uh, to be such thing. So the singularity is just the region where uh, quantum gravity effects become strong and important. And so uh, we have, uh, if, uh, you know, the, the previous picture for an evaporating black hole should be replaced by something like this one, where there is a future on the other side of the, of the singularity. And so now the question of unitarity is to explain how is it that a state that was pure in sigma one remains pure at sigma three. But now there's a chance of answering the question because you don't need to forget about what happened to the particles that fell into a singularity. In fact, the quantum theory of gravity should tell you what happened to them. And there should be some effect that is still registered at sigma, at sigma three that allows you to correlate you know, something here with the Hawking radiation so that the state is pure in this final uh, instant. So in this picture, talking about the uh, page curve again, the entropy, this entanglement entropy we're talking about just goes up and up and up here because uh, uh, in, in, in terms of, you know, uh, Hawking radiation entropy all the way until the end of evaporation. And then uh, it goes down to zero because of strong quantum gravity effects, but very late once the black hole has completely evaporated. But of course, the question is, what is this radiation correlated to in order for this final state to be pure? Now, in a theory that like look quantum gravity, where uh, you know, the fundamental states of the quantum theory are discrete, then uh, you know, discreteness gives you the answer, which is exactly the reason why, I mean, the, the same property of the approach that allowed you to compute black hole entropy, remember, Black hole entropy is computing the degeneracy of, uh, of, uh, of a state which you would call mac a macroscopic black hole of a given area. When you say, I have a black hole that is macroscopic and has this area, in fact, you're saying this is my coarse grain, low energy description of the system, but this corresponds to a whole lot of microscopic states. This is how we actually compute black hole entropy. Similarly, if you want to describe, uh, you know, how is it that this final state is actually pure, you have to look for correlations between the Hawking radiation that was radiated and this microscopic structure of space-time at the Planck scale. So the picture that arises naturally from this is that, you know, uh, uh, evolution is actually unitary when you actually describe it in terms of the fundamental theory. And that uh, the current the degrees of freedom that purify the Hawking radiation at the end of evaporation are not, you know, effective field theory type of uh, of uh, of degrees of freedom. They are not particles emerging out of this uh, 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 singularity after evaporation, but they are defects, you know, little tiny defects or you know, minor di differences in this microscopic structure of space time that coarse grain observers don't actually they are not sensitive to, but in the microscopic theory, you have them. If you take them into account, then the view is that the evolution from sigma to sigma prime would be unitary because of correlations between the Hawking radiation and this microscopic structure. Very similar to what happens with very normal systems. Like if you have you know, uh, a newspaper 
there is information written in the newspaper. If you burn the newspaper, the information seems to be uh, destroyed. But of course, nobody would claim, okay, this is a problem. There is a problem with unitarity. When I burn a newspaper, I cannot read the newspaper anymore. We all believe that the world is deterministic and, uh, and the quantum version of that unitary. And that after you have burned the, 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 the newspaper, the information remains there. It's just, it has become uh, uh, degraded or very difficult to re recover because it's now uh, coded into, you know, um, the microscopic details of the products of combustion, the microscopic details of the correlation between atoms after you have burned the newspaper. Similar, a very similar picture arises in a theory of quantum gravity like uh, loop quantum gravity, where you do have this microscopic structure, this microscopic local structure of space-time. Space-time is made of atoms it's, uh, it's, uh, itself, and so it is at the deep UV Planckian regime where you sh should look for the degrees of freedom that purify the final state. Why? Because this Hawking radiation was correlated with, uh, you know, quantum field theory excitations before that actually, you know, the Hawking partners correlated with the Hawking radiation that were forced to hit the ultraviolet regime. They went straight to the Planckian regime and modified the microscopic structure of these uh, states. And it is there where the information remains coded after the black hole evaporation. Okay, so the entropy goes up when you look at, uh, you know, when you just trace, um, when you consider, you know, uh, uh, field theoretical degrees of freedom, you trace out the interior and uh, it just goes down at the end. If you take into account this microscopic degrees of freedom, the page curve goes down only once the black hole has completely disappeared in this picture. There are models just to, I mean, this is a, a scenario. It's very hard to actually realize this in detail, uh, but there are simple models where we can actually uh, do some calculations and show that this type of mechanism actually uh, works. All right, um, thank you. Um, I think before we finish the discussion by asking about prospective future directions, Leopoldo, would you like to give your perspective on black hole information paradox? Here. Yeah, so <clears throat> good. <laughs> so I, I want to I want to highlight I had this in my when I give colloquia. Um, oh, so sorry, I should so, maybe stop sharing. Oh yes. Uh, so I want to emphasize uh, this is a here, right? So I have this this page in, in my colloquia, which is Hawking concedes bed, and this this refers to, of course, the bed where the information was destroyed or or unitary evolved. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. Um, oops. Uh, I don't know if you can see the, this slide. Uh, so yes. the, it was all over the news. Uh, so I think that this is more or less the consensus that information evolves uh, unitarily. Now, in the context of the ADS-CFT, this is, this is obvious, right? So we are saying everything that you have in gravity, you have in a quantum field theory. So quantum field theories evolve unitarily, end of the story. That's, of course, uh, not super satisfying because people would like to know in more detail exactly what's going on. But at least the, the big, you know, the, roughly the answer we have and, and the computation that we have been able to do in this context of ADS-CFT, where we are able to count very, very precisely, including log corrections, give you uh, a sense that yes, it, the, there's, there should be a resolution to the information paradox. Now, about the mechanism, the details on how that happens, um, then I, I have to, to refer you to the, to the research recent research that, that I mentioned at the beginning. So people have been able to compute the entanglement entropy. Uh, um, so, so Alejandro wrote the formula, trace uh, rho, uh, rho log rho, right? That is the formula. Now there is a technique, a standard technique to compute that quantity, which is called a replica trick. I don't know if you if you have heard it, but anyway, so there, there's a way that, that, that you compute it and what, um, what has been shown recently, and this is what I was referring previously, is that uh, that computation, so that computation you can try to do it kind of as a subtle point in, uh, in quantum field theory. And you see that there are two different kinds of contributions that contribute 
so for the redundancy that to this to the to the answer and for early times you have let's say there there's a, a, a kind of contribution um, that is very different from what is happening at late time and that is how the page curve uh, is reconstructed in this context of of the string theory so now um let me tie this up with what I think is is in the in the future of a string theory for me personally. Uh, so these toy models are toy models of two-dimensional gravity. They are basically in this in this line in the middle here. So ADS2 basically ADS2 on one side, and there's a one-dimensional model that is this SYK model. Now, what what I have been telling you and what my most of my work is in this line up up here ADS CFT for black holes of dimension four, five, six, and seven. But you can take certain limits of those black holes. So now again, everything is, is done in a very rigorous, uh, well-defined setup. I can take limits where most of the description boils down to, let's say, a, a near horizon ADS3 region in which there's a dual that is CFT2. And, and here, for example, with my former student Marina and a postdoc, uh, Jun Yan, we were able to apply this, um, sort of use this arrow to describe the entropy of all black holes that we know in ADS CFT, basically ADS four, five, six, and seven, using just one very universal uh, method, this curve CFT. Now, what I think would be great for the field is to to develop this arrow here, where you have uh, a two-dimensional description of almost any black hole, effective, and and then in that description we already know how the the information paradox, not even that it gets resolved, but we know exactly how. So there's this computation of the entanglement entropy that receives different kinds of contribution at different times. So this is sort of like my dream for, for the field, to go into tackling these more dynamical questions of black hole, but in this context, it will be by focusing on, on a particular description of, of this generic black hole. So that I, I think I got two in one there. Okay, yeah, perfect, um, thank you. So I think we can now close the discussion. Alejandro, would you like to say a few last words? What are promising directions from your perspective? Are you muted? So all, all these are uh, very, um, they, they might seem as very theoretical questions. You know, we're wondering about what happens with information after the black hole evaporates. Real black holes take ages of the universe to evaporate. Um, um, black hole entropy is probably something that we won't be able to measure in, you know, we cannot do lab experiments with black holes. And, but all these questions, which are of very uh, theoretical nature, uh, suggest um, or strengthen some perspectives. And, uh, and in, on my side, I mean, I think it's, it, it gives uh, confidence that discreteness at the Planck scale might be an unavoidable necessary feature of quantum gravity. Uh, of course, loop quantum gravity predicts these kind of things, uh, but loop quantum gravity is still you know, an approach. There are many open questions and things to be resolved. So there are promising directions in the theory itself, you know, trying to actually make contact with low energy physics out of these fundamental uh, uh, quantum states that we actually uh, understand well. It's an open uh, question. Trying to include matter into the picture is uh, remains open to a certain degree. Uh, so these are these are questions where there are people actually working and uh, not, not, uh, not myself at the moment. Uh, clarifying this black hole entropy uh, by including the matter of degrees of freedom is something that I expect uh, could be a promising direction. Uh, but I also believe that it is uh, promising to, uh, you know, taking the uh, taking that this discreteness seems to be essential for describing unitarity and for understanding black hole entropy. In my view, there should be uh, there should be physical manifestations of this underlying discreteness. You know, like before we understood the uh, atomistic nature of matter uh, there were plenty of effects that were that we we now understand because matter is uh, is discrete like friction diffusion uh you know uh, examples are you know brownian motion and the the use of statistical methods to actually describe what happens in in condensed matter physics uh, ex uh experiments in the lab uh 
you know, the atom atomistic hypothesis, which is not an hypothesis anymore, and it's part of, uh, you know, our understanding of nature, uh, is uh, something that led to all sorts of, uh, that leads to all sorts of physical manifestations that uh, are observable. So I think it is also promising to actually take seriously this, uh, this apparently necessary discrete structure of space-time or, or discreteness of physical Planck scale and try to reconstruct uh, or, or to obtain phenomenological implications that we could actually test and observe. Because, because that would be great. I mean, having some inputs from observations will certainly be very helpful in constructing a quantum theory. Of gravity. And so my latest efforts go a lot into this direction, in addition to considering the, the very theoretical problem of uh, unitarity. And I think one can do some things. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, there, are, there are all these questions. What is the nature of uh, dark energy? We, uh, what is the nature of dark matter? Uh, what is the underlying mechanism that produces fluctuations that we observe at the CMB? For all these questions, there are some partial answers here and there. But I believe that quantum gravity might have an important saying on these questions, and we should we should actually consider this question seriously from the perspective of quantum gravity. So I think that's where the future might be very promising. Okay, thank you, Alejandro, and thank you to both of you for agreeing to participate in today's panel discussion. As I said, this was the first panel discussion organized by the YRQG. We expect more to come in the future. Um, and yeah, so we would also like to thank the audience for submitting their questions and helping us to prepare this event. So with this, um, have a great remainder of the week and see you soon. Bye-bye.